Well, my dad turned, was one of the very, very few who became a baptized Christian in Japan. And I think, I think what happened was when he was going to high school, he came under the influence of one of the first uh, missionaries that went to Japan, and that would be the Methodist in those days, in the Methodist church. So he uh, became a baptized Christian in Japan, which is very, very rare. And uh, on my only visit back to Japan many few years back, I asked uh, one of my uh, r relatives if, if he knew uh, why my dad or how he became a Christian. And, and he said that he heard that my dad came under the influence of a missionary while he was still going to high school in Japan. So when he became baptized Christian in Japan, I think he got disowned by his family and friends. And that's why he decided to come to America <laughs> to where the, from where the missionary had come from. And my mother was a bit adventurous, I guess, and it was her uh, desire and goal, apparently, to go overseas, and uh, so this was her opportunity. During the war, there was that flu epidemic and many died. I understand uh, I had a, an older sister who died in that flu epidemic, and my mother lost one, I think, miscarried. So the, the oldest uh, living one, uh, so that uh, we always called her as the first, uh, and then the second, I came third, then the fourth. Uh, girl, and then my brother, fifth, so <laughs> I think my dad got a lot of teasing that he finally caught his son. <laughs> so uh, there were four girls and a boy that grew up in our family. You know. My dad's boss, who was a very wealthy man living on Marine Drive, wandered my dad within walking distance, and so he had that house built for us. I think there are about three other houses on that particular property now, at least two. But uh, his boss wanted fresh eggs every day, so he uh, uh, provided everything, the chickens and everything. My dad uh, had the care of them. I remember we had chickens in there, back fenced off there. And, it was my, one of my jobs every night to collect all the eggs. <laughs> and then half of them would uh, would be for us, and the other half my dad would take down to uh, his boss every morning. We did not grow up in a typical uh, Japanese uh, community, like either Marpo, or down on Powell Street or Fairview. We were uh, totally out of the Japanese community. Uh, and that was because of my dad's work. Uh, I, I really, really enjoyed, I just lived with a camp from one summer to the next, guide camp. And uh, uh, I just loved it. I just, and so my friend, my closest friend was a, a, a guide in our guide company. Uh, but I was the only Japanese, you see, uh, in that guide company. The, uh, I guess I was, uh, I, I felt very stuck up, I guess. I felt I was uh, above those other Japanese in the Marble area because I didn't associate with them and I didn't speak Japanese, blabber way in Japanese. <laughs> and uh, I felt that, uh, that I was Canadian and they weren't. Uh, it's just a, a mental uh, superiority complex I developed. <laughs> uh, of course, I eventually came around to realize how wrong that was, but at the time, growing up, I didn't go to language school, and I didn't have close Japanese friends. Uh, I just didn't move in that uh, 
community. My community was with the Caucasians, uh, and partly it was because of where we lived. And uh, my dad, I think, had a lot of thoughts that the Nisei had. He wasn't interested in us being fluent in Japanese. He was just interested in us first being good Christians and second <laughs> good Canadians, and after that, nothing mattered. So he wasn't uh, anxious that we be fluent in Japanese. Uh, that wasn't his uh, <laughs> priority, which, of course, as I became an adult, realized it was uh, to my detriment that it wasn't. I think I got taken with the, the story of Florence Nightingale. <laughs> I decided, and that was uh, in my very, very, when I was very, very young, you know, I think I was still going to public school. I was going to be a nurse like her. <laughs> yeah, I never thought ever of doing anything else. I was through uh, high school, I was through my senior matric, which is equivalent of first year university. And after Pearl Harbor in December and January, I started my training at Vancouver General, which always, looking back on it, I wonder why they let me start, because I was only there six weeks then when we had to leave. But uh, uh, I took my, uh, I took my senior matric at McGee, which was the equivalent of first year university, because they would only take one Oriental in the nursing school a year. And the year I, in September when I should have gone into my nursing, they had, they had to take uh, a Japanese girl who was in the university program. She had priority over me. That's why I had to wait to the January class. So why they took me in in January with the war going on, don't ask me, but anyway, that's what happened. Well, it was uh, towards the end of the week and I got word that I was to uh, go to the superintendent's uh, office on a Saturday morning. And I thought, I couldn't imagine what I was called there for, because, uh, you know, you had to be either terribly bad or terribly good to be called to her office, and I couldn't see me fitting in any of those two areas. So uh, I remember going there around around 10 o'clock or so, and uh, she, it must have been hard on her to have to break this news to me, because she was the one that I knew she knew me since I was a little girl serving tea when she went to the other team. Anyway, uh, she told me that the, the, the hospital board had met the night before and decided there were three of us in training at that time. Uh, I, being the, the newest one, was the first one to get the news that I had to go, I had to leave. So this was Saturday morning. and. She asked me if my sister could come and pick me up and if I could be out of residence by noon. So I had just three hours notice to leave. And being Saturday, my classmates had all gone for the weekend. So for years, it was a big mystery to them. They didn't know and they tried to find out where I had disappeared. I found this out, you know, years, years later when we finally caught up again. But this is all of a sudden I disappeared, and just they tried to, and they asked the uh, uh, the instructor, you know, where I was. She says nobody would say a word; they wouldn't talk about it at all, wouldn't, and they just wondered where I just suddenly disappeared. <laughs> you know, so I had, uh, as I say, the three hours notice to leave residence. Oh, it's pretty shattering, <laughs> because that. Uh, you know, that was my only life ambition from the time I was growing up. And thinking it just suddenly ended like that, I just, <laughs> it was a little difficult to take. <laughs>
Did you see it coming? No. No. Because when you're in training there, you don't know what's going on in the rest of the world. We were just so caught up with our... It was all we could do to keep up with our studies and keep up with our daily uh, work there. We had we knew something was going on out there, <laughs> but uh, had no idea what the how serious it was, and uh, so uh, uh, so it was uh, uh, it was a real shock. But of course, I think my sister kind of saw it coming because uh, you know they were ex she had exposure to the newspaper and things that were going on so she kind of felt I guess that it wasn't going to be possible for me to finish my training seeing as how I had just started in a week could you see I was going to spend the next three years there with the war going on yeah my my dad's faith, I just wondered where he got all his faith. He just kept telling me, don't worry, uh, that things will work out because God's still looking after you. And I thought, how could it, if he allowed this to happen? <laughs> my memories are a little bit dim on that because I was, I was so hurt by having lost my nursing uh, training that uh, uh, I sort of lost my vision, I guess, at that point. Uh, my sister was sent up very early to look over the areas and uh, uh, help get the uh, people relocated, so uh, she saw that Castle was going to be for like the Protestants to go and so she found a house for us and as soon as she found a place she uh, sent for us so we didn't go through what the others went through just being given so many hours. I understand some of them only had a matter of few hours notice uh, before they had to be leave and that was mainly the ones up the coast, I think they were told about noon. You have to get six o'clock boat down to Vancouver and to be sent into Hastings Park. And I remember uh, my sister getting a phone call from Dr. Shimon, say, come and help me. Is this the first boatload of people coming down from the coast to Hastings Park? And there isn't a thing ready for them. There's nothing. This is not even milk for the babies. So come and help me. So I remember her having to rush out there and see what could be done. It must have been uh, must have been terrible because these people didn't have much time to pack up either. So they came with very little, and to land up in a place where <laughs> there was nothing. <laughs> And they were put into the big buildings there. And the only, the I think I understand they tried to put up curtains to, to give themselves family a little privacy, but uh, it must have been pretty bad. I didn't actually go and see, but my sister was there to uh, see it right from the beginning. Well, when things looked as if they're pretty bad, and I couldn't take it anymore. I used to just try to think of what my dad told me not to worry that uh, that God was still looking after me so uh, uh, not to worry but uh, I couldn't see how he was looking after us <laughs> put us through all this but I think eventually I, I've come to realize it wasn't God who put us through all this it was uh, really man's uh, inhumanity to man when you come down and look at it what caused it and out of that God tries to resurrect some good, which I feel in this case was that he, uh, that was how the Japanese got to know the rest of Canada. My sister went up first as the public health nurse in arranging the, making sure that the health facilities were going to be acceptable, and she found a house uh, for us 
that we could live in and sent for us, which was, um, which was a, a good mile away from the uh, center of Caslo, where the Japanese community was. We were what we call up the hill. <laughs> and um, so um, uh, it, it was, it, it, well, in a way, it was a little difficult because I, we were not in that Japanese community. We were, we were outside of it. So, uh, uh, but I guess I was kept busy enough with work, helping my sister work in the clinic that didn't have time to sit and be sorry for yourself. And uh, my next sister got involved in setting up the school for the, for the Sunset children. So uh, uh, we were not in that actual central uh, Japanese community, even uh, even during the war, we were always <laughs> outside. <laughs> well, it was just a uh, one center street. I don't know if you call it a town or village, <laughs> but uh, it wasn't big enough to be a town actually. But there was just one main street. Um, and I think there were a few Caucasian families still there, and they used to boast that at its height, Caslow had something like 16 saloons, was it, or something? <laughs> and it was all these vacated uh, hotels and buildings that the Japanese uh, relocated into. There were very, very few Caucasians left, still left behind there. Uh, and during that time, of course, I helped my sister in the clinic, and uh, Dr. Shimatakara was a great teacher, and I should have taken advantage of his uh, uh, willingness to teach, but I just kept thinking, oh, I'll get all that when I get in training, and I didn't pay too much attention, uh, which I was sorry for later, but um, uh, he, he did teach you some of the things which afterwards I discovered you don't get in nursing and I should have paid more attention. <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, I think uh, I think I could have taken more advantage of that year in Caslo. Up until that time, my generation and older thought Canada was just in BC. <laughs> I mean, they didn't have a clue when went on the beyond the Rockies, and had no interest in learning. But this upheaval changed it, and uh, and it's been to the good. <laughs>
they put us in a, a little tiny room uh, in this particular building. It was sort of divided into two parts, and one part was for the isolation unit, and the other was uh, the classrooms, and uh, upstairs to that was the dormitory where the probationers uh, were put. And once you went through your probationary per period, uh, you went over to the main nursing residence. Uh, but there was this constant move. But um, Sumi and I were put in a separate room uh, above the isolation unit where we would have been totally uh, isolated away, <laughs> could be <laughs> isolated away from everybody else. Um, but uh, uh, I, I didn't let that bother me. I mean, I was just glad I was in a nursing school. And um, so uh, uh, we were there about two and a half years. And something happened, which is quite a long story. But anyway, the superintendent of nursing turned to me and says, and she says, after all, you have to, I have to acknowledge you've been treated just like anybody else in your class. And oops, <laughs> I guess when she said that, she realized that we hadn't been treated like everybody else in our class. Because within a week, Sumi and I were allowed to join our classmates <laughs> in the nursing residence. And uh, uh, of course, that didn't bother me. I mean, I was there getting my training. That's all that mattered. It wasn't the residence that mattered. Um, yes, there was this, uh, uh, I guess he was like a hermit. He, he lived alone and uh, hadn't associated much with the world. Anyway, he was brought in with a, an, an emergency a herniotomy uh, operation. And in those days, if he had a hernia surgery, you're in about a couple of weeks, not like today. <laughs> anyway, it was his day of discharge, and I was getting him ready to, di to uh, be discharged. And he looked at me and he says, you know, he says, um, you're not so different from the other girls. And I looked at him and I thought, oh, I said, oh, well, thank you. I didn't know what he was coming at. No, he says, uh, he says, you're just like any of the other nurses. This is, uh, uh, <laughs> and uh, you're not bad at all. I says, oh, and I looked down and I still didn't know what he was getting at. He says, when he, the doctor told him he had to come to the hospital for his hernia operation, which was an emergency. He wasn't scared of the operation. He was scared because he had heard there were two Japanese nurses at the hospital. And at nights he couldn't sleep because he thought he was for sure going to be stabbed in the back by a Japanese nurse. And then he looked and he says, but you're not so bad after all. He's, you're just like all the other girls. And uh, that really struck me as, uh, uh, as amusing because I had had no idea that all that whole time he was, he must have been in real terror <laughs> night and day, frightened to death of <laughs> what if he was going to get out alive, I guess. <laughs> He was a minister, but we were lifelong friends, so uh, I had known him all my life, you know. Uh, and I think when we were, when I was still in Caslo, I think uh, one one morning my mother said to me, uh, "They used to have what they call them. Is it Nicoda or a go between?" Uh, had approached her and asked uh, what she thought of giving me to him. He was a minister at this point. He had, he was ordained he was ordained at the evacuation time when when the Japanese had the curfew on them. So he had to have special permission for his uh, ordination because that was an evening service. Uh, I think my dad was quite shocked and he gave gave him a 10-minute lecture on the importance of marriage being based on solid Christian principles. 
I was so embarrassed. There he was talking like this to a minister. <laughs> and then he turns around and he ends up by saying, I don't believe in long uh, engagements. Uh, uh, this is uh, August. He says, I want you to get married next month. <laughs> I said, but I was just starting a, uh, I've been just starting a new uh, year as the uh, school health uh, nurse, and I wanted to have at least one year with a, in a school. So uh, anyway, uh, it ended up that they let me have. I was there. Yes, I had to have it for September until. Yeah, I had almost a, a year of being able to serve the church, the, serve the school mm. as a nurse uh, before getting married. <laughs> and when we came to Vancouver, uh, we were only here about a week when he had the heart attack and passed away. Uh, but the young people here, uh, they decided that in his memory, uh, they would go ahead and form a congregation and see what we could do. So uh, the congregation did start in Vancouver, even though he had uh, passed away. It's, uh, it's just been uh, gradually phased out now, so I'm not on any national <laughs> committees anymore. So it's just what I do within my own congregation. Uh, and I'm, uh, so I'm still on the, the board, but I'm getting off the board. Uh, I think it's uh, <laughs> time. <laughs> I could have got through a lot of this uh, without my faith. Uh, uh, I know there are times when I, I I could have lost my faith, but my dad uh, was my my, the, my great uh, uh, leader in faith that no matter what happened, he never lost his faith. And he kept saying that we may not know the reasons, but that God is always looking after you and, and that the bad things that happen to you aren't due to, to God's doing, it's man's and humanity to man. And, and God tries to work around that and make the best of it. So, uh, 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 once I began to understand that, because I, I was, uh, I went through a period of time where I kept saying, "Well, if God is so great and wonderful, why is He allowing this to happen? He shouldn't allow it to happen." Uh, until I, I, I realized it wasn't His doing; <laughs> it was, uh, it was man. Uh, and then God tries to work around that and, and make the best of it. Well, I think the two big influences in my life, which uh, I'm very grateful for, is both my church life and my girl guide life. I think those two, uh, I, I think, have been sort of anchors for me, and I can always uh, 
depend on to uh, keep me going. Because I really think unless you have something <laughs> to be able to hang on to, it must be pretty hard. I don't know because I've always had, uh, I've always had those two. How, what I like to be remembered is always being a, a happy person, very optimistic. I don't really store all that much in uh, hopes of being remembered as a wonderful Christian woman. <laughs> that to me uh, 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 ha has no meaning. <laughs> I hope that uh, you can always think of me and, and have happy thoughts. So I'm grateful. I think I've had a, been fortunate to have had the life I've had. I have no regrets. <laughs>